I watched the impeachment hearings on Wednesday. The GOP is a repository of mental defects. It's like any American with unresolved trauma woke up one day and said, I don't need medication. I'm not sick. I'm a Republican. More on the impeachment probe in a second. But first, this is the mop up for March 21st, 2024. It's spring. I'm David Feldman in New York City. Thank you so much for finding me. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. And please subscribe to my channel as well as my newsletter. The House impeachment probe continued on Wednesday as Republicans try to establish some fleeting connection between Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings and his dad back when Joe was Barack Obama's vice president. The entire premise of the impeachment sham is to offer a counter narrative to Donald Trump's four criminal trials scheduled to begin sometime this year. Republicans are hell-bent on perpetuating the lie that a drug-addled Hunter Biden corralled then-Vice President Joe Biden into firing a Ukrainian prosecutor whose investigation supposedly was getting too close to uncovering the corruption of Burisma, a Ukrainian gas company whose board of directors Hunter Biden sat on. Biden did in fact, as vice president, get that prosecutor fired. But it wasn't to protect Burisma. He was told to tell Ukraine to fire the prosecutor. He was told by Barack Obama, the entire EU, and Western bankers who said they wouldn't guarantee a $1 billion loan until that prosecutor was gone because he wasn't going after corrupt Ukrainian oligarchs. It had nothing to do with Burisma. Yes, Joe Biden bragged that he went to Ukraine and told them to fire the prosecutor. Otherwise, you're not getting the $1 billion loan guarantee. Yes, he's on tape bragging because Barack Obama told him to say that. The EU told him to say that. The Western bankers who had to guarantee the $1 billion loan told him to tell the Ukrainians to fire the prosecutor. It had nothing to do with Burisma or Hunter Biden. Republicans want to establish that Hunter Biden, along with Joe Biden's brother, Jimmy Biden, enriched themselves by trading off the vice president's name. But so far, the impeachment probe keeps coming up short. But that doesn't matter because this isn't a fact-finding mission. It's about creating smoke and hoping enough voters will think there's some sort of fire. Enough smoke that convinces low-information voters, i.e. MAGA morons, that Trump and Joe Biden are equally corrupt so... Why not vote for the guy who's going to persecute all the people I hate? And that guy would be Donald Trump. No matter how badly Republicans fail at establishing any connection between Joe Biden and the business dealings of his son Hunter or his brother Jimmy, House Republicans continue to use the power of subpoena to embarrass our president. Wednesday's impeachment hearings, though, were the real embarrassment. However, if you're in the thrall of Donald Trump, you just keep going. Never back down. Never let the truth get in your way. James Comer, chairman of House Oversight, one of the three committees conducting the impeachment probe, James Comer is now saying he wants President Joe Biden to testify before his committee. So far, this clown has forced Jimmy Biden, Hunter Biden, every single one of Hunter Biden's business associates to testify. And he's found nothing, nothing. 
So why is he asking Joe Biden to testify? Because he knows Biden would never testify before the impeachment probe. It's an issue of separations of power. Presidents don't testify. Gerald Ford, he testified after he pardoned Nixon. But presidents do not testify. Nixon didn't testify. Trump didn't testify during their impeachment hearings. Biden is never going to testify. Republicans know this. And that's why the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, James Comer, is demanding this week that President Joe Biden testify. He knows Biden will refuse. So then Republicans can say, what is Joe Biden trying to hide? Between now and Election Day, the Republican refrain will be, if Joe Biden is innocent, answer the subpoena and come up to the Hill and testify, you know, the same way Jim Jordan did after he was subpoenaed by the January 6th committee when they wanted him to testify as to what exactly he and Donald Trump discussed during their several phone calls on January 6th before, during, and after the insurrection. You know, just like Jim Jordan testified. Come on, Mr. President. What are you trying to hide? Testify. You know, the same way Peter Navarro, Steve Bannon, Mark Meadows, and Dan Scavino all agreed to testify before the January 6th committee when they were subpoenaed. By the way, Navarro began serving his sentence this week after being found guilty of contempt of Congress. Steve Bannon was found guilty of contempt of Congress for the same reason Navarro was, but Bannon is still out on appeal. The Justice Department refused to prosecute Mark Meadows and Scavino for contempt of Congress, even even though they both ignored the January 6th congressional subpoenas. But that will B, the Republican narrative. What is Joe Biden afraid of? Why won't he testify before the House impeachment committees? This is the narrative Republicans need to neutralize Donald Trump's four criminal trials where there's no way Donald Trump will ever put his hand on a Bible and swear to tell the truth. There is no way Donald Trump is ever going to testify in his four criminal trials. Now, Trump's lawyers in all four criminal trials are struggling to keep Donald Trump from taking the stand because they know if he testifies under oath, he's not just going to commit perjury. He's going to incriminate himself. He cannot help himself. You know, one of the reasons the judgments came in so high after the E. Jean Carroll and New York civil fraud trials is because Trump testified in both. So he will not be testifying in any of those criminal trials. Republicans survive off false equivalencies. In order to defang the horrible optics of Donald Trump afraid to testify in all four of his criminal trials, in order to dull the sting of Democrats mocking Trump for being petrified of testifying on his own behalf, you know, What's Trump so afraid of if he's innocent? That kind of stuff. The Republicans are now starting to demand that Joe Biden testify before the three House impeachment committees because they also need to be able to say, if Biden has nothing to hide, then come up to the Hill and testify under oath. Again, it doesn't matter what the truth is. There will never be an impeachment of Joe Biden. Republicans hold a razor-thin majority in the House. The votes simply aren't there 
for impeachment. But this is all about embarrassing the Biden family, keeping the lie alive. Mike Johnson will never bring an impeachment vote to the floor because he'll lose. Instead, the investigations will continue through Election Day, holding out false hope that the Biden crime family will finally be exposed. In other words, to paraphrase Marshall McLuhan, the purpose of the Biden impeachment probe is the Biden impeachment probe. It's not about impeaching Joe Biden. It's about the probe. That's it. And it always was. This investigation has been going on since 2017. They've been trying to impeach Joe Biden ever since Donald Trump became president. The second Donald Trump sat his doughy ass down inside the Oval Office, he set out to destroy Joe Biden because he knew Biden was most likely going to run against him in 2020. This impeachment probe, the one we're watching right now, this sham, has its roots in Donald Trump's very first impeachment. If you remember, Trump was impeached the first time for holding up a shipment of missiles to Ukraine when, during that perfect phone call, he told newly elected Ukrainian President Zelensky that the weapons to fight Vladimir Putin's Russia were approved by Congress and they're on their way. But first, you need to do me a favor. I need you to find dirt for me. Dirt on Hunter Biden. See, Trump knew Biden was going to be running against him. And Trump's plan all along was dig up dirt on Joe's deeply troubled son, Hunter. Specifically, dig into Hunter Biden's Ukraine connections. Dig into his Ukraine connections. Why Ukraine? Because Biden's Ukraine connections would serve as a counter-narrative to Trump's Russia connections. Trump and the Republicans know there is incontrovertible evidence that Donald Trump, as far back as 2015, was reaching out to Vladimir Putin for both financial and political help. Read the Mueller report. So the Trump White House immediately began spinning a counter-narrative that the Democrats, this is their narrative, the Democrats, as far back as 2016, were getting assistance from Ukraine. If the Democrats say Republicans and Donald Trump were getting assistance from Russia and Vladimir Putin, we're going to say the Democrats were getting assistance from Ukraine. Rudy Giuliani, of all people, this alcoholic, was tasked with creating the illusion that Ukrainians, not the Russians, were the ones who hacked the Democratic Party's server in 2016 and turned those embarrassing emails over to WikiLeaks. The embarrassing emails, the ones that humiliated Hillary Clinton. Now, you're probably wondering, why... If Ukraine was assisting Hillary in 2016, why would Ukraine and not Russia, why would Ukraine hack the DNC and hand over embarrassing emails to WikiLeaks in the run up to the 2016 presidential election? Doesn't make sense, but it's not supposed to make sense. I can barely follow this story because there is no story. It's just mayhem. That's what Donald Trump produces. Chaos, confusion. There is no narrative 
to this impeachment probe. Rudy knew all of this was for low information voters, i.e. MAGA morons, who barely read headlines. And those headlines are supposed to be Joe Biden's Ukraine connections are just as dirty as Trump's Russia connections. That was the entire purpose of Rudy Giuliani conducting his sham investigation into Hunter Biden. And it's not supposed to track. It's not to not supposed to make sense. In fact, by keeping this story muddled, it's impossible to disprove. They know what they're doing. If you can't explain a story, nobody can say it's a lie, which it is. It's just a series of lies. But don't take my word for it. Ask Republican Senator Chuck Grassley, who accidentally admitted all of this on Wednesday. He was asked, Senator Grassley, Republican, are you paying attention to the House impeachment hearings? And he said... Accidentally, who can follow it? Who can follow it, he said. The answer, nobody, because there's nothing to follow. But that doesn't matter. Now, think of Donald Trump, okay? Whatever dirt you dig up on Donald Trump, he will fight you to the bitter end. And then, after it ends, he still keeps fighting. If he loses... He still keeps fighting. And that's precisely what this impeachment, the Biden impeachment probe, is. The difference, the difference is the dirt on Trump is real. The dirt on Biden is fake. And no matter how fake the dirt Republicans dig up on Joe Biden turns out to be, no matter how many times Republicans humiliate themselves, degrade themselves, and are forced to backtrack. They just keep flinging more fake dirt. That's because the same way the investigation is the entire point, not the facts, the dirt, the dirt is also the point. It doesn't matter if the dirt is manufactured Because Republicans learned a long time ago that when you just keep throwing fake dirt, eventually a perception begins to emerge where low information voters figure there must be something there. You know, it worked on the Clintons to some degree, to some degree. Eventually, even Democrats began to say, You know, I like Bill and Hillary, but there always seems to be a cloud of corruption hanging over them. Yes, because there was a vast right-wing conspiracy manufacturing that cloud. We know it was completely manufactured because when Bill was president, the independent counsel, Ken Starr, a Republican, who was part of that right-wing attack machine, Ken Starr spent years and close to $50 million trying to find something to indict Bill Clinton with. But he couldn't find anything. Zero. Zilch. Nada. So, Ken Starr, the independent counsel, and I'm not making this up, He literally had to manufacture a crime. Ken Starr, the independent counsel, again, had absolutely nothing on Bill Clinton. He was about to close up shop until he came up with the idea of a honeypot, a sting operation. Create a situation where Bill Clinton had to commit a crime. Linda Tripp told Ken Starr that Bill Clinton was carrying on with Monica Lewinsky. Nothing illegal, purely consensual. But Ken Starr also knew 
that Bill Clinton was being forced to testify in the Paula Jones sexual harassment civil lawsuit. Yes, sitting presidents have to testify in civil lawsuits filed against them for any damages they may have caused before becoming president. In this civil suit, Paula Jones was suing Bill Clinton for sexually harassing her when he was governor. So, Ken Starr set Clinton up, and he told Paula Jones' attorneys to ask Bill Clinton to ask the president while he was under oath during his deposition in the Paula Jones civil lawsuit, ask him about Monica Lewinsky. Ken Starr knew Clinton would lie under oath to protect his marriage. And all because of that, Clinton was impeached because he lied under oath about getting oral sex from Monica Lewinsky. The entire executive branch shut down for nearly two years because of that. Lindsey Graham was one of the House impeachment managers at the time, and he railed about the rule of law. Bill Clinton, he said, lied under oath about oral sex. What do we tell the children? What kind of nation are we if a president can stay in office after lying under oath about oral sex? Bill Clinton must be removed. Fast forward two decades later, of course, Donald Trump rapes a woman, faces nearly 30 other credible sexual assault accusations. Brett Kavanaugh is accused of raping a woman, and suddenly Lindsey Graham is outraged by these vindictive Democrats who he angrily accuses of conducting malicious Witch hunts. Remember the temper tantrum he threw on the Senate Judiciary Committee during the confirmation hearings for Brett Kavanaugh when he was accused of rape? Remember he was foaming at the mouth? I assume that was foam on his lips. You never know with Lindsey Graham. The Republicans have been looking for dirt on Joe and Hunter Biden since Trump became president. There's nothing there. Joe Biden didn't take a $10 million bribe while he was vice president to order Ukraine to fire the prosecutor looking into Burisma. We now know that's a lie fed by Russian intelligence to an FBI informer who was just arrested by the very same special counsel who indicted Hunter Biden. No conflict of interest, okay? Special Counsel Weiss indicted Hunter Biden for taxes, and he also indicted Smirnov for lying, spreading lies from Russian intelligence about Joe Biden taking a bribe from Burisma. We know for a fact that Joe Biden, as vice president, never took part in any of Hunter Biden's business dealings. If Republicans had something better to do, they would put this nonsense to bed. But they don't have something better to do. They're not allowed to do anything else. Their job is to get Donald Trump back inside the Oval Office. That's the only responsibility they have. They can't even pass a border bill because Donald Trump feels that would jeopardize his chances of getting reelected. Trump will not even let them pass a budget because if America's credit rating is downgraded once again, like it was last year, thanks to Republican brinkmanship with the debt ceiling, then Donald Trump can blame Biden for destroying America's credit score. So the only thing Republicans can do is impeach. Impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, the head of Homeland Security. 
and censure Trump's political enemies like Adam Schiff. And, of course, keep the idea of Joe Biden's fictitious international crime syndicate alive. The White House, last week, asked Speaker Mike Johnson to put an end to the impeachment probe so that everyone could get back to the business of government. You know, like keeping it open. The budget for 2024 was supposed to get passed back in October. Still, no budget for 2024. But after the White House asked Speaker Mike Johnson to drop the impeachment probe, Mike Johnson said, and I quote, The President of the United States doesn't dictate how Congress conducts its affairs. No, the former President of the United States does. That's literally why we don't have a border bill. Donald Trump said, no border bill. I need the migrant crisis to run on. And Joe Biden can't get any credit for solving the border. That's my crisis, and nobody gets to have it. I'm not sharing my border crisis with anyone. It's my ice cream. Go get your own. The House impeachment hearings on Wednesday were nothing short of pathetic. Republican witnesses included Hunter Biden's former business partner, Jason Galanis, who couldn't be there in person because he's serving 189 months for defrauding investors and for market manipulation. You can't find a more credible witness than that. And by the way, Hunter Biden had nothing to do with Galanis's crimes. The other key Republican witness was Tony Bubulinski, a disgruntled business partner of Hunter's, who insists that... Because he once met Joe Biden while he was Hunter Biden's business partner, Biden, President Biden, therefore, was instrumental in all of Hunter Biden's business dealings. I met Joe Biden while I was doing business with his son. Therefore, Joe Biden took part in all of Hunter's business dealings. Bubulinski spent a good portion of his testimony talking about his time as a member of the armed forces, or as Donald Trump would call him, a sucker. Meanwhile, the Democrats, their key witness, used to be the Republicans' key witness. That would be Lev Parnas, who worked for the Trump White House under the leadership of Rudy Giuliani. His job back then was to work with Rudy to find dirt on Hunter. But now Lev Parnas is a witness for the Democrats. Parnas testified Wednesday that no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't find any dirt on Joe Biden or his son Hunter. But like I said, the American people can't and won't follow any of this, because nobody can. Nobody is supposed to. Republican Senator Chuck Grassley, even a reporter over at Punchbowl, admitted on Wednesday that the Republican impeachment narrative is impossible to keep track of. It's the Maltese Falcon. Can anyone really figure out how Sam Spade solves it? It's Godfather, too. Can anyone really explain how Michael was able to figure out that Fredo was in on the assassination attempt simply because Fredo lied about not knowing Johnny Ola? Ask someone to explain Godfather, too, or the Maltese Falcon. They can't, but it doesn't matter. It's fun to watch. And that's what the Biden impeachment probe is. It's a complicated storyline that you're not supposed to be able to figure out. You just know who the bad guys are. And the bad guys are Hunter and Joe Biden. That's all you need to know. And the heroes, the Sam Spades, the Humphrey Bogarts and all this, are the three chairmen 
of the three committees charged with conducting the Biden impeachment probe. There's Jim Jordan. He's chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Then there's Jason Smith. He's chairman of House Ways and Means. And of course, James Comer, chairman of House Oversight. The three of them are tasked with digging and digging into the Biden family's international crime syndicate. And these three men have sterling reputations. They exude character. They drip integrity. They're veritable G-men straight out of one of those old FBI comic books my father used to read. They're the untouchables. There's nothing on these three men because it would be the height of hypocrisy for these three men to drag Hunter and Joe Biden through the mud if they themselves had any dirt on them. Take Jim Jordan, for example, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Nobody cleaner, squeaky clean Jim Jordan. I mean, sure, he's the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, went to law school, but failed the bar and lies to the American people by saying he never bothered to take the bar exam because that's precisely why everybody goes to law school. So they don't take the bar and never have to practice law. I mean, why would you go to law school to practice law? That makes no sense. And sure, when he ran for speaker last autumn, Republicans who said they wouldn't vote for him got death threats, as did their wives, kids, and pets. And I'm not making it up about the pets. But hey, nobody actually got killed. They were just death threats. And sure, he refused a subpoena from the January 6th committee and wouldn't testify about the role he played in the lead up to the insurrection. He wouldn't answer any questions like why was he talking to Donald Trump before, during and after the attack on the Capitol. But that's all there is on Jim Jordan. Nobody's perfect. He lied about passing the bar, threatened to kill the people who wouldn't support him for speaker, and he tried to overthrow the United States government. But that's all. Nobody's perfect. That's it. Nothing else on Jim Jordan. Oh, right. When he was a wrestling coach, hundreds of his players were molested by the team doctor, and he didn't see it. Some guy named Dr. Strauss was molesting hundreds of wrestlers at Ohio State. And, was, and when Jim Jordan, Coach Jim, was told Dr. Strauss was molesting his wrestlers, Jim Jordan reportedly said, yeah, that's Strauss. Yeah, that's Strauss. Like it's a sitcom. Like it's the name of a sitcom. Yeah, that's Strauss. And of course, there are accusations that Jim Jordan engaged in witness tampering trying to prevent the wrestlers from testifying about what exactly Jim Jordan knew and how he covered it all up for Dr. Strauss. But other than aiding and abetting the sexual assault of the wrestlers he was supposed to be coaching and participating in the January insurrection, ignoring a subpoena to testify on what exactly he knows about the attempt to overthrow the government of the United States and how much he participated in that. And, of course, all the death threats against the families, uh, members of Congress who didn't support him for speaker. And, of course, failing the bar and yet thinking he's qualified to chair the House Judiciary Committee. Other than all that, Jim Jordan, straight shooter. And then there's Jason Smith, He's chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. And this is the guy you want probing the Biden crime family because Jason Smith is another straight, and I mean straight, shooter. He's like a G-man in the tradition of J. Edgar Hoover or J. Edgar Hoover's longtime lover, Clyde Tolson. The two of those men were squeaky clean, just like Jason Smith, who was also squeaky, squeaky clean, 
squeaky. Jason Smith is a good Christian with good conservative family values. For, for example, he adamantly opposes same-sex marriage. In fact, Jason Smith hates same-sex marriage so much, just to be on the safe side, he won't even marry a woman. You never know, right? Better safe than sorry. Yeah, Jason Smith has never been married, just like J. Edgar Hoover and J. Edgar Hoover's longtime lover, Clyde Tulson. There is absolutely no dirt on Missouri's very own unmarried, confirmed bachelor, Congressman Jason Smith. He's squeaky, squeaky clean. Well, there was one tiny little scandal back when Jason Smith served in the Missouri State House. PETA, as well as some other animal activists, got the state of Missouri to pass these strict laws governing puppy mills. As you all know, puppy mills are cruel and inhumane. But after these anti-puppy mill laws were passed in Missouri, Jay Smith, Jason Smith, as a member of the Missouri State House, worked to reverse some of the more draconian laws regulating dog breeders. And it turns out that maybe he was doing that out of self-interest because his darling mother earned a living as a dog breeder. So can you really blame the confirmed bachelor who is not, nor will he ever be married, Jason Smith? He loves his mother. He loves her so much, he can't find a woman to replace her. That's why he's single. No woman can measure up. No woman can come close to his mother. So as an act of love for the only woman in his life, Confirmed bachelor, Jason Smith, who opposes same-sex marriage so much that he won't even marry a woman just to be on the safe side. Because he loves his mother so much, he worked behind the scenes to make life easier for dog breeders, like his mother, the only woman he will ever love. And while Jason Smith's mother is most definitely a dog breeder, Jason Smith is not a breeder. His mother is a breeder. His father is a breeder. But Jason Smith, no breeder he. He's not a breeder. There is not a single shred of evidence to suggest that the unmarried Republican congressman from Missouri, Jason Smith, is in any way, shape, or form a breeder. But don't take my word for it. Ask Florida Congressman Matt Gates. He's pretty much told anyone who's interested that Missouri Congressman Jason Smith is no breeder. Matt Gates, you might remember, is under investigation by the House Ethics Committee on charges of possibly violating the Mann Act. Possibly transporting underage girls across state lines, implying them with drugs in return for sexual favors. I don't know if any of that is true. I do know former Speaker Kevin McCarthy says Matt Gates belongs in prison. But I don't want to get involved in all this partisan bickering. All I know is Matt Gates orchestrated the removal of Kevin McCarthy from the speaker's chair. And Jason Smith, who is not a breeder, was furious with Matt Gates for destroying Kevin McCarthy's career. I think Jason Smith said something along the lines of, I'm so angry with Matt Gates, I could spit. I think that's what he said. He said, I, he said, I'm so angry with Matt Gates. I, Jason Smith, confirmed bachelor. I'm so angry. I, Jason Smith, who opposes same-sex marriage. I'm so angry I could spit. I think that's what he said. And then, confirmed bachelor, Jason Smith, congressman from Missouri, 
who's not a breeder. He called Matt Gates a liar. He said in the run-up to Kevin McCarthy's removal that if Matt Gates' lips are moving, then he's lying. And Matt Gates did not like that. He didn't like being called a liar by Missouri Congressman, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith, who is leading the impeachment probe of Joe Biden. And so Matt Gates went on a podcast, and apparently some people are saying that Matt Gates implied that Jason Smith doesn't like girls. That's not a nice thing to say. This is the headline from LGBTQ Nation. It's a headline. Representative Matt Gates insinuates GOP Representative Jason Smith is a closeted gay man. What a horrible thing to say about someone. And, what a, and shame on LGBTQ Nation for, for printing this. Where would Matt Gates get an idea that 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 GOP Congressman Jason Smith is a closeted gay man. That's ridiculous. Confirmed bachelor Jason Smith is a Republican. How could he be gay? He'd be a Democrat if he were gay. Republicans hate gay people. Jason Smith opposes same-sex marriage. Do you think a closeted gay man would oppose same-sex marriage? I don't think so. It makes zero sense. Why would Jason Smith, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, take on the burden of leading the Biden impeachment probe if he himself had something to hide? That would be like, oh, I don't know, that would be like then-Congressman Lindsey Graham leading the impeachment of Bill Clinton for lying about his sex life and then us finding out that Lindsey Graham also lies about his sex life. I mean, if Lindsey Graham lied about his sex life, he would never impeach Bill Clinton for lying about his sex life, right? So how could Jason Smith be a gay man knowing he's going to burn in hell for lusting after another man while at the same time lead the impeachment against Joe Biden for the crime of, well, they haven't quite figured out that one yet. They haven't quite figured out what the the crime is. But give them time. They'll, they'll, They'll find a crime. Anyway, LGBTQ Nation writes that Matt Gates insinuated that Jason Smith is a, how can I put this delicately? Let's just say a homosexual, man-groin-loving, male-on-male, anti-evangelical hypocrite. I think you can read between the lines there. And LGBTQ Nation irresponsibly draws the conclusion that Matt Gates insinuated Jason Smith is a Homosexual, man-groin-loving, male-on-male, anti-evangelical hypocrite. They concluded that from the following statement that Matt Gates made during an interview. Now, I don't understand how LGBTQ Nation concluded that Matt Gates was calling Jason Smith, a homosexual, man groin loving, male on male, anti evangelical hypocrite. Here, you, I'm going to read to you. Let me go full screen here. You decide for yourself if Matt Gates is calling Jason Smith a homosexual, man groin loving, male on male, anti evangelical hypocrite. So, this is what uh, Matt Gates said during an interview. Let me just take some water here. Uh, just spilled some water. He said, Jason Smith says, if my lips are moving, I'm lying. Well, you know what? If Jason Smith is breathing, he is living a lie. 
There might not be another member of Congress who lives a lie every day more than Jason Smith. And Jason Smith knows exactly what I'm talking about. And by the way, so does almost every member of the House Republican Caucus. So, there's a good deal of projection in Jason Smith calling me a liar when it's Jason Smith who literally has to live a lie. And I honestly pity him for that because, you know, it wouldn't be something that I wouldn't live that way. I'll just put it that way. So, Jason, I would check yourself before you come at me with any accusations of being dishonest about what I say when you're dishonest about how you live and what you do, unquote. I don't know. Matt Gates, he never once said Jason Smith is a homosexual, man groin loving, male-on-male, anti-evangelical hypocrite. He just said Jason Smith is living a lie. So I don't know how LGBTQ Nation comes up with the headline, Representative Matt Gates insinuates GOP Representative Jason Smith is a closeted gay man. Where did they pull this from? Then there's James Comer, who is chairman of House Oversight, and he ran Wednesday's impeachment hearings. Now, maybe James Comer is a Trump lapdog. Maybe he refuses to admit Hunter, Jimmy, and Joe Biden did nothing wrong. Maybe he's a Republican lickspittle who will lie, say anything to keep his party in power. But one thing you can't say about Kentucky Congressman James Comer, one thing you can't call him is a hypocrite. I mean, sure, he's a stupid backwater hick who can't believe there's actually such a thing as indoor plumbing and a woman who will have sex with him who's not his cousin. But other than that, Jim Comer of Kentucky is squeaky clean. Squeaky, squeaky, squeaky clean. Just like Jim Jordan and Jason Smith. The triumvirate of the impeachment probe. All three men, squeaky, squeaky clean. Nothing hypocritical, other than, you know, maybe making millions setting up a series of shell companies that are identical to the ones he's accusing Joe Biden of owning. Other than that, he's squeaky clean. Other than lending his brother money the same exact way Joe Biden lent his brother money, nothing hypocritical about squeaky clean Republican Congressman James Comer, chairman of the House Oversight Committee, looking into how We impeach Joe Biden. Squeaky, squeaky, squeaky clean. But there is this single mom, Democrat, who's running against Jim Comer this year. Her name is Erin Marshall, Democrat. And she just put out a new ad reminding Kentucky voters that... While James Comer insists he's pro-life and wants to ban abortion, Marilyn Thomas, his girlfriend, back in the 1990s, says James Comer drove her to Louisville, Kentucky, drove her to the big city to abort his baby. Even worse, he was against abortion back then. Here is Democrat Erin Marshall's latest commercial. She's 29, and in this commercial, she ends up looking in the mirror and talking to her younger self. It's a really well-made commercial. She's trying to explain to her younger self, she's 29, but she's talking to herself when she's in her early 20s. She's trying to explain what has happened to America during the past seven years. 
she's trying to explain to her younger self how abortion is going to get outlawed as you get older and how the choices made available to her younger self are no longer available to women who are now in situations similar to the one Erin Marshall found herself in years ago when she got pregnant. Here's the ad from Erin Marshall, Democrat, who was running against James Comer. I know you're in the middle of making the hardest choice of your life. When birth control fails, no one wants to think that that 1% chance of getting pregnant will happen to them, but it did. First of all, I want you to not lose hope. I want you to know it'll all work out. The people at Planned Parenthood will be incredibly kind. They'll tell you it's your choice with no pressure either way. And you're lucky you're making this decision when you do have choices. A whole lot's happened over the last five years. Donald Trump will lose re-election. He'll incite an insurrection and people will die. After that, Roe v. Wade will be overturned by his Supreme Court. It's led to chaos in the country. Over 60,000 women have gotten pregnant after being raped in the states that now ban abortion, including here in Kentucky. It's why you'll decide to run for Congress. Yes, you. I know you can't imagine that right now, but you got a college education, you have a career in business, and you have a story to tell. You'll be running against Congressman James Comer and the choices he's made. Not just his phony investigations into President Biden's family, but also how he's an anti-abortion Republican who once took his girlfriend to get an abortion. And how he chose to support Donald Trump despite accusations of Trump sexually assaulting 21 women. For congressmen like him, it's just a game to dehumanize women and put our lives in danger. But you can be part of changing all that. in the same situation as James Comer. And this was the choice that you made. I want you to meet your son, Teddy. He's incredible. Today, you're a proud 29-year-old single mom from Frankfort, Kentucky. James Comer doesn't know who you are, but he will soon enough. We won't give him a choice. Aaron Marshall for Congress. If you want to donate, it's AaronForKY.com. Aaron for KY. Should be Jason Smith for KY.com. But it's Aaron. Aaron for KY.com. All right. You may want to donate to Aaron Marshall for Congress. Well, there's also this story from nine years ago in the Kentucky Courier-Journal. Headline, college girlfriend says James Comer abused her. Oops. This was when Comer was running for governor at the time. He didn't win. This was, uh, headline is from May 4th, 2015. Well, I mean... Should we dig into James Comer's personal life? Would that be appropriate? Would it, is it right? Is it moral to dig in to the personal life of one of the three men leading the impeachment probe? Oh, yeah, it is. Let's go full screen here. Uh, where do I find it? There we go. I'm sorry. It's a little confusing. All right. This is from the Courier-Journal. A woman who dated gubernatorial candidate James Comer while the two were in college said in a letter to the Courier-Journal on Monday that he was physically and mentally abusive to her during what she said was a two-year relationship. Quote, did Jamie Comer ever hit me? Yes, wrote Marilyn Thomas, who attended Western Kentucky University with Comer in the early 1990s. In the four-page letter, Thomas detailed a relationship that she said, quote, was toxic, abusive, and caused me a lot of suffering. 
His controlling and aggressive personality alienated me from most of my family and friends at the time. Thomas said Comer threatened and belittled her and that she ultimately moved away from Kentucky in an effort to leave that chapter of her life behind. She now lives in New York City, where nobody ever threatens or belittles anybody. Sorry. Uh, The article continues. In the letter, Thomas does not offer specific details of the alleged physical abuse other than to say Comer struck her. She told a reporter that she never filed a police complaint against him. In the letter, she said she had been, quote, emotionally weak at the time. Quote, everything I did, everywhere I went, and everyone with whom I interacted had to be approved by Comer, she wrote. Quote, consequences were violent and swift otherwise. She said Comer became enraged in 1991 after they visited a Louisville abortion clinic and learned that she had used his real name on a form requiring proof that she had an escort to drive her home. The Courier-Journal continues, Wendy Curley, who said she shared a dorm room at Western Kentucky with Thomas, said that Thomas and Comer had, quote, a very rocky relationship. Curley said, I would see bruises on her wrists and stuff where she'd say, oh, I ran into a table, I fell, just that kind of stuff. Curley said Thomas never told her she was being abused. Quote, it was always something to cover for him. She didn't want anybody to know that he was abusive to her. Wendy Curley, who said she shared a door. Oh, we already read that one. She also said Comer took Thomas for an abortion. Quote, I know she ended up getting pregnant in like October of 1991 and had an abortion in the beginning of November. And I remember him seeing her to the dorm and just dropping her off after they got back from the abortion Curly said. Thomas said she still has paperwork from the visit to the abortion clinic. Quote, I kept that piece of paper as a reminder of what desperation and rock bottom feel like. For more than 20 years, that piece of paper has been a source of anxiety and shame, but it was mine. It was only mine. She said the paper is in a lockbox at a Kentucky bank, and she didn't have immediate access to it. In the letter to the Courier Journal, Thomas said that Comer once called her parents at 2 a.m. to make violent threats against me. Mary Rose Thomas, Marilyn Thomas's 83 year old mother, said in an interview that Comer called her home one morning some 25 years ago. Quote, I couldn't understand everything he was saying. But he said something about your daughter's going to be killed. It was something like that. Your daughter's going to be killed. It was something like that. So there you have it. There, there's the triumvirate, the three men leading the impeachment probe into Joe Biden. House Judiciary Chair Jim Jordan, House Ways and Means Committee Chair Jason Smith, and House Oversight Chairman James Comer. I don't know. Maybe these are not the best men to start digging into Hunter Biden's troubled past. Maybe these are not the best men to challenge Joe Biden's integrity or decency. Maybe they should not be looking into Hunter and Joe Biden. In fact, maybe nobody should be looking into Hunter and Joe Biden. The planet is on fire. Ukraine and Gaza need saving. And our government is about to shut down on Friday. How about Republicans stop protecting that Nazi clown Donald Trump 
and start protecting the American people. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. That's the best way that I can remain in your feed. Please share this episode with uh, like-minded friends. Just copy and paste the link and put it in a text, an email, or on social media, please. That's the best way to help me. Of course, leave a comment. I read all your comments. And I do have some corrections that I have to get to. Thank you to Bob in the chat room on YouTube for keeping the conversation civil. And uh, this is an audio podcast, so please take me with you when you're walking, driving, if you're helping somebody, if you're, if you know, if you go to somebody's house to assist them, uh, if you clean their kitchen, cook for them, uh, listen to me as an audio podcast, wherever you get your uh, audio. It is a privilege to talk to all of you. Thank you for your time.